Good evening, everyone, and thank you for all of your contributions today. I sadly had to do a few putting out of fire, so I missed the first sessions, but a wonderful afternoon. Uh, we have an enormous variety and extraordinary dexterity of thinking going on. So many, many thanks for all of your efforts. And it is my great pleasure to now introduce, introduce our third and final keynote speaker, having started in the world of anthropology, moved into the precision of social history with moral dilemmas around the world of armaments themselves, our final keynote to, uh, tonight is Professor David Serlin from the University of California at San Diego. I was delighted uh, that the DHS uh, generosity allowed us to transport someone across the Atlantic uh, and to have him round off these range of discussions, to bring in this idea of communication, the impact of the effects of war, 
though this may not be the only, uh, or indeed is only happily, uh, rarely part of the issue surrounding disability. And part of what I'm hoping to, to suggest in the inclusion of him in our keynote trio is the way in which design is perhaps propelled forward by the agency of uh, the thinking and contentions and requirements of disability and its most rich life experience. Now you may well know his work but you and ha will have seen that in the biography he kindly supplied but it really was for me his book called Replaceable You that led me to think this would be such a rich uh, final motif in our trio of keynotes. A wonderful book that juxtaposes the world of sensorial experience gender and identity politics and the relationship of designed objects whether it was prosthetics in the reformation of dexterity and the prolongation of limbs or if it was the transformation of the total body and the psyche within it with transgender identity or the transformation of the visage that was the extraordinary American initiative uh, with Hiroshima victims uh, coming to the new skills of plastic surgery. So I think an underlying thread across all three keynotes has been this relationship of embodiment to design practices in moments of conflict and subsequent recuperation. So I think it's fitting as we move towards our third day where there is a greater constellation of discussions about the relationship to peace and protest that we have such an eloquent advocate and dare I say it activist in the world of gender politics, identity and public space. Mm -hmm. David has done wonderful work thinking about urban spaces, about public environment's relationship to disability. We're delighted to have his student Louise with us today, but the fact that she could only travel on a slow train, not a fast train, to come and join us is I think a hallmark of how the impact of disability and our relationship as designers and design historians still has a very big contribution to be made both in terms of practical solutions but also in terms of policy making and agency. So it is my great pleasure to introduce David Serlin. We're in for a very interesting evening. Thank you David. Thank you, Claire, for that really lovely uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very humbled by it, and I'm very humbled by the uh, uh, invitation to come here. Um, I pro some of you probably know that it's a little bit more than a 13-hour journey to get here. Um, and uh, except for a few bumps along the way, it has been a lovely one. Um, I want to thank Claire for uh, inviting me, uh, and I'm also very grateful to the Design History Society for bringing me here, uh, and to all of you for giving me the opportunity to share some of my uh, recent work with you, which on the one hand kind of encapsulates a lot of what I've been thinking about for, for a long time uh, with regard to my book, Replaceable You but also to some newer work that I've been doing. And uh, the, the, the text that I'm going to read today, as well as many of the objects that I'm going to share with you, are uh, in relation to a, uh, my, my forthcoming book, which is called um, Window Shopping with Helen Keller, uh, um, Architecture and Disability in Modern Culture. And I've become very interested in the history of architecture, not just in kind of its more recent iterations in terms of accommodation and access, but earlier uh, ways in which people with various kinds of uh, physical or cognitive impairments moved through cities um, and uh, negotiated the built environment. Um, so I go back to the 18th century, actually, rather than to the 1960s, where a lot of uh, historical work it has been done and continues to be done. Um, so I'm going to share with you some uh, images uh, and I'm going to be sharing with you some ways of thinking about the history of design 
and disability. And as I often say to my students, if there's a particular image that you would like me to go back to so we can sit with it a bit during the Q&A, I'm more than happy to, uh, to do that. Um, at the very end, the screen will go black, but it doesn't mean that I can't uh, go backward to something that's particularly provocative and interesting. Um, and if it's okay, some of the images, because they're archival and they didn't come out as well as I wanted them to, they're a little bit on the lighter side. So if it's possible to dim the lights a bit more so that we can have uh, more, that they're a bit more vivid without it affecting the camera, I'd really be, I'd appreciate that. Okay. That's great. Is it, uh, is it sort of clear enough for folks in the back? Okay, thank you. In 1913, the Perkins School for the Blind in Boston, the oldest school for students with visual impairments in the United States, uh, which was made famous as the school attended by a young Helen Keller, designed and printed this tactile map for its students. The map stretching from Scandinavia to Africa and from Ireland and Spain to Russia and Turkey, features textured spaces demarcating the Atlantic and Mediterranean oceans, as well as the Baltic Sea from the land, embossed ridges indicating national or continental boundaries, and braille letters translating the first three letters of each country. Uh, the original did not feature any writing, which is uh, visible here, uh, which was added later. I don't know if you can even see it. Um, uh, it's a little bit on the unclear side. Such a map is, for design historians interrogating the legacies of the First World War, an interesting artifact in the period just before the outbreak of the war. The map would literally be redrawn only five years later with the armistice and the dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which you can see. As an artifact of media history or of disability history, however, the map is actually far from unique. And as scholars such as Ivan Erickson and Vanessa Warren have argued, even ubiquitous in blind education by the early 20th century. During the previous century, new printing technologies enabled those with visual impairments to engage a growing assortment of tactile books, including books on geography and cartography on their own, as well as participate as citizens in the growing culture of the state education system and public education more broadly. In schools for the blind in the United States, as well as those in Britain, France, and Germany, maps not unlike this one would have been used by students, but also made available to adults through lending libraries funded by public charities and religious organizations, providing an educational as well as an experiential alternative to the passive and often isolating pursuits characteristic of 19th century blind culture. Indeed, the availability of embossed and tactile books created a subculture of blind book sharing that led some Victorian moralists and physicians to repudiate the practice, fearing the spread of disease, including sexually transmitted diseases, as a result of promiscuous touching of book pages. And I think it was last summer there was a conference at Birkbeck College on the tactile and the touch in the Victorian imagination. And Vanessa Warren from uh, University of Manitoba had these amazing images of uh, people uh, who were blind reading under the bed covers and touching their eyes or touching other parts of them that, of course, led the Victorian imagination to go into full uh, riot mode. <laughs> The modern association between blind book readers and the transmission of infectious diseases, the force of its pitched hysteria notwithstanding, did not discourage educational institutions of the period from expanding opportunities for learning about the world even further to include populations of blind, deaf, and physically impaired people who, even a generation or two earlier, would have been segregated in asylums or workshops or else left to fend for themselves on the streets if they didn't have family members to take care of them. For example, at approximately the same time that embossed maps of Europe and tactile books were circulating in the United States, institutions like the Sunderland Museum, which is now part of the Tyne and Ware, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Confederation of Affiliated Museums, in Northern England sponsored special event days during which blind patrons, including children, were invited to touch objects of interest drawn from the museum's collections. 
Um, and this is uh, a photo spread from the magazine The Graphic from 1913. The idea originated with re retired curator John Alfred Charlton Diaz, who invited children attending the Suther Sunderland Council Blind School to the museum. The program was so successful that within a few months, invitations were extended to adults, including many elderly members of the extended community, to attend weekend sessions. This double page spread uh, from June 1913 uh, in one of the le UK's leading photog photograph based news magazines during the early decades of the 20th century depicts a number of action scenes, which won't be very clear to people in the back, but I can describe them in detail, in which blind children and adults listen to lectures and engage in various tactile practices. In formal galleries, as well as in uh, storage areas uh, where they got access, children and adults were introduced to natural and human-made objects, taxidermy snakes and birds and polar bears, scale models of ships and airplanes, and shotguns, and also Wedgwood Portland vases. And uh, these are the kinds of objects that would have been off limits uh, to sighted patrons. So what do we make of these two archival objects? The tactile map on the left-hand side of the screen and the double page spread from the graphic on the right on the occasion of the centennial of the First World War. Both objects which date to the years just prior to the outbreak of war, and in fact the, this uh, double page from the graphic is from 1913, just a year before the war, these might be perceived to be marginal and even inconsequential to narratives of modernism especially since they are objects, and in the case of the graphic article, depictions of an event that are perceived to be uh, relevant to only very specialized historical interests. That they predate the First World War is, I would argue, not incidental to the multi-layered process of contextualizing and interpreting them. After all, when early 20th century objects pertaining to disability are brought into discussion, the tendency is to associate them with subjects of war, surgery, technology, or rehabilitation, thus crystallizing in the imagination an unavoidable link between the problems of war and the solutions of design. For instance, um, in the convalescent culture uh, following the end of war in 1919, sorry, I have to go there, um, the status of the blind veteran uh, takes hold in the public imaginary as a result of campaigns by national industries and care services. This was a uh, poster that was first distributed in 1919 uh, of a uh, veteran being led uh, by a young girl with the uh, rather guilt-inducing phrase, blinded for you. Uh, posters with drawings like this one represent blindness as an affront to both the masculine independence and economic autonomy of the returning war veteran. The gender dimensions of this image, the dependent blind veteran being led by a little girl, is central to its rhetorical power and is intended to produce a sense of social crisis that I would argue is ideologically distinct from the novelty of blind children and pensioners, those who were already fundamentally disempowered in the pages of the graphic. Historians such as Joanna Bork, uh, Anna Cardin Coyne, and Deborah Cohen have made compelling arguments for the ways in which war, both national and those on an unprecedented global scale, like the First World War and the Second World War, uh, have played and continue to play a dominant role in histories of disability and design. But disability fits neatly, perhaps too neatly, within prescribed areas of knowledge drawn from military experience and military values because of the vast government resources and the vast social and industrial investments in the machinery of death and in the post-war interventions of medicine, surgery, convalescence, and work-related rehabilitation. The First World War undoubtedly had an effect on the idea of the totalizing disability object, the metonymic function of which is to reflexively associate histories of war with histories of disability and thus histories of rehabilitation, medicine, and compensatory technology with histories of disability. Uh, but uh, for three examples that prove this point, um, this is a page from a German surgical journal from 1917 featuring uh, a range of prosthetic arm attachments with which a veteran could fulfill multiple work assignments. The idea being that 
uh, the prosthetic arm would have a kind of empty attachment uh, space at the end into which you could put lots of different kinds of implements uh, uh, for doing different kinds of industrial work. Um, they also had them so that you could put in a toothbrush or a razor or a comb and you could uh, perform personal hygiene. Um, this is a photograph from 1919 of a tin mask made by the American sculptor, or as she's sometimes called it in the hist histories, sculptress, uh, Anna Coleman Ladd, who was invited to make these tin masks for French veterans of the war, uh, who were so disfigured that they were known by the mournful synecdoche, les gueules cassées, the broken faces. What she was able to do was she was able to take tin, pound it very thin, and she was able to sculpt facial masks that would cover up uh, very uh, sort of horrific facial disfigurements, add mustaches to them, and attach them either by a ribbon in the back or by a pair of glasses. And uh, maybe the most famous one uh, from the 20th century, the molded birch wood splint manufactured for the US Army in 1942 uh, designed by uh, Americans Charles and Ray Eames following the U.S.'s entrance into the Second World War after the attacks on Pearl Harbor. What they were able to do was take this birch wood and they were able to use heat uh, um, uh, to mold it and sculpt it. So this could be uh, a splint as well as uh, I've seen this uh, in museums as a sort of beautiful art object. But is it possible to historicize disabled design, let alone disability in general, without reference to war, to its vast industrial character, to institutions of care, its professions of expertise, the authority of its objects, uh, uh, excuse me, its devices developed to kill or its objects to convalesce. Using war as a pivot is historically and historiographically useful and using modern warfare as a kind of watershed phenomenon makes sense conceptually. But as the tactile map and the museum photographs make evident, many elements or artifacts of disability identifiable with modernism predate 1914, just as elements or artifacts identifiable with post-modernism uh, predate 1945. Indeed, it is arguable that histories of disability-related objects are shaped by histories of war and rehabilitation because of the way that they traffic in nationalistic or even sometimes sentimental feelings that help us collectively forget and ideally displace other parallel or competing histories of disability. These histories, far from sentimental, involve our shared complicity for subjugating, isolating, segregating, and dehumanizing people with disabilities. In this archival photograph from 1908, for example, girls in uniforms at the Royal School for the Blind are arranged in a pyramid-like structure, uh, one on top of another, holding Union Jack flags, presumably for their parents' amusement, but no doubt also for the amusement of hospital staff, as modulated through the jingoistic power of empire. Similarly, in this photograph, produced around 1915 for a blind boy school by the Christian Missionary Society in the Fuchao region of China. Chinese boys are posed on gymnasium equipment, holding still for the camera uh, to demonstrate for supporters back home in London that they are being trained to be good, docile Christian subjects. And I just want to point out, because it's a little on the blurry side, uh, that it's not that the kids are playing they're being told to stand still at the very top of all of these uh, gymnastic, uh, um, you know, they, they're being told to stand still. And of course, if you know anything about the history of photography, you know that uh, they were put in pretty, pretty precarious situation for a little while longer than we would have wanted them to. Uh, what both of these images preserve uh, beyond institutionalized humiliation and cruelty masquerading as care is a model of enforced habitus, as Pierre Bourdieu, Pierre Bourdieu might say, in which disciplining and routinizing the bodies of children is mandated to maintain control over them in the name of the nation, or the name of organized religion, or perhaps both. Soldiers of the nation, soldiers of God, soldiers of the asylum, under the regimes of habitus, it really makes no difference. The intensity and urgency of such images of exploitation notwithstanding, there are other tales of modernism can be, that can also be told. Tales about trying to reform and rehabilitate the disabled or disfigured body to become functional, productive, and recognizable to non-disabled populations. 
tales about recognizing the subjective dimensions of bodily difference, using one's hands to read a map, for example, while promoting various forms of integrity and autonomy. Yet tales from disability history that do not necessarily partake of the darker shades of modernism, tales bereft of sentimentalism, historicize disability from the perspective of design history, uh, um, these tales are rarely told. For example, efforts by John Dees and colleagues at the Sunderland Museum may seem to have revolutionized curatorial practice. But it was in fact returning to an older convention of engaging the public through objects that had fallen out of favor. As Constance Klassen and Fiona Candlin have argued in their respective works on the role of touch in museum practice, by the mid-19th century, the discomfort over touching and perceived violations of public hygiene manifest expl explicitly in the fears of Victorian officials over those naughty tactile books had shifted curatorial standards. Whereas 17th and 18th century patrons to museums such as the Oxford Zashmolian were invited to both look and touch objects to learn about them, by the mid-19th century, museums had adopted policies that were strictly hands-off. The privilege and exclusivity of sight, what Kevin Hetherington has described as distal relations, that is, relations in which the subject is at a distance from the object rather than in close proximity to it, continued to be maintained by museum institutions, despite what scholars like Martin Jay and WGAT Mitchell have told us about the scrutinizing of the visual of the ocular centric within the aesthetic canons of high modernism. So ask a military historian or an economic historian or a design historian how he or she uses the term modernism. And he or she will respond in very different ways with different examples, using different historiographical frameworks to do their jobs. This is because the canons of our disciplines and the historiographies that shape those disciplines are organized around what each discipline understands to constitute such things as watershed events, material inventions, scientific discoveries, epistemological shifts. Some of these overlap, as in the case of war, which is what enables so many different kinds of scholars to come to a conference like this one but most depend entirely on a historian's gravitational orbit. Yet modernism embraces both novelty as well as the recovery or reframing of practices that appear to be new, but which in many cases predate the modern. This may ex explain some of the dissonance that occurs with attempts to historicize modernism. From the use of the adjective primitive uh, for early 20th century European art, despite what we know about vivid histories of colonial exploitation, to efforts by literary scholars to recover Lawrence Stern's novel, Tristram Shandy, first published in 1759, as some kind of ur-text of postmodernism. Following, uh, consider the following terms on this list of gerunds, which I'm gonna share with you, which depending on one's relationship to discipline or his tradition can mean or, or uh, at least imply vastly different things feeling modern, being modern, appearing modern, thinking modern, working modern, loving modern, dying modern. What tacit expectations are involved in these phrases, which are meant to be or appear straightforward, and yet none of which are? What, in fact, do they actually mean? Which discipline or tradition is most useful for interpreting them? and by extension, their relationship to ongoing de debates about epistemologies of the modern. In the struggle for interpretation, whose modernism wins out? The modernism of Virginia Woolf or Neville Chamberlain? Frank Lloyd Wright or Albert Speer? Le Corbusier or Mahatma Gandhi? We have to be careful about making presumptions about war and its aftermath in crafting narratives of modernity. Of course, those threads are important, inevitable, and unavoidable. But it is just as true that many of the themes that we presumptively identify with the canon of modernism, isolation, anomie, fragmentation, disorder, and so forth, were exacerbated by the First World War, but did not begin nor end with the First World War. And certainly this is true of the interwar period. Uh, design historian Christina Cogdell has written on the relationship between streamlined design and the eugenics movement, uh, casting modernism's approach to bodily difference in a villainous role well into the 1930s, 1940s, and even into the 1950s. 
More recently, historians like Jean-Louis Cohen, taking a page from the playbook of Hannah Arendt, have argued that the full potential of modernism was realized not in social welfare or urban improvement schemes beloved by modernists like Le Corbusier, but through technologies perfected to slaughter soldiers, decimate civilians, destroy cities, and industrialize genocide. Yet surely the rise of advertising culture, one of the hallmarks of design history since the late 19th century, provides a perspective on epistemologies of the modern that are distinct from those of war. In this case, the, uh, the luxury goods market. In this 1923 advertisement for the Marmon, and I'll be very surprised if any of you have heard of it, a short-lived American motor car manufacturer uh, that was trying to compete with Rolls-Royce and Mercedes, but which disappeared with the outbreak of the Depression in 1929. A painting done by an artist identified as Countess Elizabeth Zichy <laughs> depicts Helen Keller sitting in the back seat of a Mormon with her hand touching the glass of the rear window with her eyes closed. And that's what that image is. Keller is depicted wearing a heavy black fur coat with her head wrapped in a mysterious diaphanous scarf thereby highlighting the mysteriousness of being blind and deaf. The text beneath the painting reads, and this is apparently Helen Keller speaking, I knew we were in the mountains by the atmosphere and the odors peculiar to high altitudes. Riding in a Mormon is just like sailing, the same smooth, vibrationless motion. Like those images of blind children and pensioners touching objects at the Sunderland Museum, at the core of this image is a documentation of a quintessentially modern experience, one that is, uh, of course, exoticized for marketing purposes, but also one that takes seriously the idea that she's engaging with, uh, with a kind of mode of sens sensorial capacity uh, with the world that is very particular to someone with um, uh, her disability. Keller's experience of the modern automobile is not through looking out the window, but being able to feel the atmosphere, which challenges some of the aesthetic conventions associated with car advertising, as well as the tropes associated with representing disability. In other words, this advertisement does not celebrate the successful businessman and the throes of his, later, his latest consumer item, but the experiential delight of the world's most famous disabled person. The totalizing association between disability and war has overdetermined historical approaches to disabled design, resulting in what scholars and activists in the field of disability studies have called the medical model of disability. The medical model is an instrumental approach to understanding bodily difference in which vast administrative and technical resources are mobilized in an effort to fix the body of the veteran as well as retrain him. In the medical model, bodies that have been ripped apart or traumatized are outfitted with prosthetic extensions, rehabilitated, and returned to civilian life in order to satisfy the goals of industrial productivity and economic independence that so characterize early 20th century modernity. In such formulations, disabled design thus becomes synonymous with the material culture of medicine. In making the medical model of disability interchangeable with disability history, other ways of thinking about or experiencing or feeling or embodying disability, such as here, are given short shrift. In the 1970s, uh, activists and scholars began ad advocating for a different model of understanding bodily difference, what is now called the social model of disability in which the problem was not in the body of the disabled individual, but in the society in which he or she lives. The social model of disability sees the built environment and the objects of daily life as designed problems to be challenged and changed through deliberate acts of accommodation and redesign. Give someone with a hearing impairment access to sign language interpretation, for example, and she or he is no longer someone who cannot participate. Give someone who uses a wheelchair access to a ramp, and she or he is no longer someone cut off from public space. The problem associated with disability, in other words, uh, is not located in the body of the person who should be fixed or adjusted or corrected. The problem is located in the social and spatial environment, the result of a failure of design. <laughs> 
This is why some contemporary design historians, critics and curators, including uh, people like Sarah Hendren, Graham Pollan, Richard Sandel, and Bess Williamson, to name just a few, have been endeavoring to rethink the automatic association between disabled design history and the medical model. They are working instead to historicize forms of design for disabilities that rely on the ingenuity, craft, and innovation of disabled populations, many of who, uh, who, many who uh, have taken bodily difference as a starting point for design rather than something to be corrected. I want to use my remaining time to offer uh, a conceptual framework for thinking about ways to historicize disabled design. Ways that I will argue were and continue to be shaped by three forces of modernity that emerged in many cases uh, centuries before the First World War. What I'm going to call new material urbanisms, new mediated publics, and new engaged subjectivities. In my estimation, disability objects are in effect provocations to not only think about multiple modernisms, the idea that they're not a singular one, but there are multiple ones, but also to disable the presumptions that we bring to design history as a field. Indeed, I'm ultimately sympathetic to what uh, scholars David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder have called a cultural model of disability. This is an approach to disabled design and disability history in which the subject of study is not about correcting the body, as in the medical model, or about correcting the environment, as in the social model, but about thinking about the relationship between the body and the environment through the medium of design. Bodily difference in design can be something that is treated as speculative rather than as solution-oriented, deliberative rather than didactic, imaginative and co-created rather than engineered, and even empathic. Indeed, the cultural model has the capacity to recalibrate histories of modern design by disabling our presumptions about what modernism hath bequeathed to us in the early 21st century. So I know that we are limited for time, but I did want to share some objects that I associate with these three categories that I'm putting forward. Uh, the first of which I'm calling new material urbanisms. Um, this is an ad from about 1705 for a truss maker in, uh, the, uh, in Goodman's Fields, which is sort of on the cusp between Whitechapel and um, Poplar uh, in London. And what's fascinating about it is that area is still to this day identified as an area with a lot of medical devices, and it is just a stone's throw away from the Royal London Hospital. This was an area that Londoners in the early 18th century knew to go to for things like trusses and other instruments to help the weak and lame. Um, and these were not just people who were at home. These were business people, people who worked in the city. There was an identification of this as an area, a district, where you could get different kinds of uh, objects that would allow you to get on with your working life or your life at home. So what I am interested in in this particular ad uh, is, uh, which would have appeared in uh, uh, news magazines or newspapers of the day, is this idea that people are thinking about the urban environment in newer ways than they might have even 50 or 100 years earlier. That there are devices to help them, not in other words just to get on with daily life, but to actually be able to go to work and to be able to travel um, uh, around uh, in the area. Um, this is a photograph from the late 1880s uh, from an American magazine uh, that promotes a new design for a piano. So that someone who is bedridden, either on a long-term basis or temporarily, can play the piano. And what I love about this is that it doesn't change the fundamental nature of the construction of the piano. It just kind of flips it from being something that is horizontal to something that's now vertical. I also love the idea of the sort of Victorian lady playing the piano. Uh, it's almost like she's working on a laptop in bed. <laughs> um, not for everyone, but beginning in the early 20th century, there were manufacturers of personal elevators. 
um, and you know that this is not for everybody because in the image, this, the image at the very bottom, uh, a man in a wheelchair is being pushed by someone in a maid's outfit. But the premise behind it that an elevator was not just for these newly developed buildings called skyscrapers, but were in fact uh, things that with the right kind of resources uh, you could install in your home meant that people were, would be able to rethink their uh, relationship to uh, domestic space as well as urban space, uh, especially in places like New York, Paris, London, that uh, where because of uh, limited space, people might be building up vertically rather than horizontally. Um, this is uh, an advertisement uh, by the company DuPont, which was making, as their ad says, uh, orthopedic and other uh, devices to enable people to uh, sort of live their daily lives, but also get out, in, out of the house and into the working world uh, for over 100 years, or for nearly 100 years, uh, pour malade and blessé. Uh, for the sick and also those wounded in war. Um, this is very typical of the kinds of advertisements that one would have seen all over Europe in the United States by manufacturers of uh, these kinds of devices. The one that interests me is the one right over here, which is the uh, uh, mechanical ca uh, car or the little mechanical wheelchair uh, that would have enabled um, uh, veterans of World War I in this photograph uh, of a, a group of uh, them uh, at a protest uh, in Paris in the early 1930s to get into their mechanical chairs, the very same ones sold by Dupont, and to protest the, uh, the, the poor uh, response by the, the government to pensions. So whereas earlier parades uh, of veterans might have involved walking uh, and also demonstrating their, their uh, uh, difficulty in walking by being on uh, crutches or a wheelchair uh, or, uh, or by, by foot if they, could, uh, if they could walk, here we have much larger numbers of them participating in protest march, uh, obviously showing that different kinds of devices allowed them to engage in the urban environment uh, in ways that uh, would not have been true. Uh, a generation earlier because of the lowered expense. And of course, devices like this uh, in the United States, in the UK, in France, in Germany, many of these would have been purchased by local councils or even by the national government to enable people to uh, engage in the public sphere, again, in a way that they might not have uh, been able to uh, a generation earlier. This leads me to a second category that I've been thinking a lot about for my book uh, and in my work, what I'm calling newly mediated publics, um, very much like the new kind of public that's constituted by these new kinds of devices um, that allow people to engage in the public sphere in ways that uh, they might not have been able to uh, before. Um, and its relationship to modernism is actually very interesting if we look at architectural history. This is the Perkersdorf Sanitarium designed by uh, Josef Hoffmann in Vienna in 1904. Um, it was designed as a sanitarium uh, for people who we would now identify as, as middle class or upper middle class. But the design features of the, um, which, and it's now a public hospital, but the design features would be, uh, have, have some of the significant hallmarks of what we might identify as early 20th century modernism. Um, this is a little alcove in the, uh, in the sanitarium this is original furniture designed by Hoffmann. The floors, the t white tiles, every aspect of it was designed by Hoffmann in the kind of spirit of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright or others that were interested in creating total environments. Um, the idea of using white ceramic tiles that can be cleaned easily, the idea of using giant uh, glass walls, uh, glass bricks to create glass walls, or curvilinear walls made of glass, they all uh, which we identify with as, as many of the hallmarks of a particular kind of early 20th century modernism, they're all found here. This is also true of the Paimio uh, Clinic, uh, which was designed by Alvar Aalto in 1927. Um, Alvar Aalto called uh, his clinic a medical instrument, and while I sort of take issue with the way in which that associates this particular kind of architecture with a kind of medical model approach, it also opens up lots of interesting ways for thinking about modernism's link to 
uh, bodily difference and to different ways of thinking about health. Um, this is the uh, exterior of the uh, Pai, Pai Mio Hospital uh, clinic, rather. Um, and this is one of the chairs designed by Alvar Alto using a very similar technique that would be used later on by the Eameses when they designed their splint. Um, this is a design that is, you can see in uh, museums of modern art and design all over the world. But how was it originally used? It was originally used in sunrooms like this for tubercular patients to just sit and absorb the heat, uh, get some, uh, some um, sunlight, get some fresh air, and to relax. Um, so designs that were specifically uh, uh, created to enable uh, people to uh, live uh, and, and to uh, feel better sort of are now incorporated into the aesthetic of modernism. Um, these kind of curvilinear walls, uh, which were balconies where people in wheelchairs could get sunlight and fresh air, um, were duplicated in lots of places, including uh, this ad from the late 1930s for the Finsbury Health Center in London, uh, which, as you can see on the bottom, shows many of the hallmarks of design that 30 years earlier were used by people like Josef Hoffman at the Perkersdorf Sanitarium, as well as by Alvar Aalto glass brick walls, lots of uh, interior spaces. Um, and what I love about this is the juxtaposition between that kind of new clinic with its new, uh, uh, newly designed chairs and clean spaces with that kind of old model of an old clinic, uh, which uh, is being repudiated uh, by this kind of new, fresh modernism. Um, this is a, an examination room in the Finsbury Health Center, uh, Health Clinic, ex excuse me, uh, which, as you can see, has absorbed many of the items of furniture as well as the kind of hygienic principles that one would have found um, 30 uh, years, er 35 years earlier or so in the Perkersdorf Sanitarium. Uh, last but not least, this is a uh, school that was designed uh, by an American architect named Burn Burnham Hoyt. Um, this building no longer exists, but it was developed as a school for uh, uh, disabled children in Denver, Colorado. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of this building is that it is thought to be the first building in the United States that didn't have any staircases at all, but instead was designed with a ramp. Uh, what you see here is the back side of that ramp, and it was divided sort of down the middle for uh, both uh, uh, pedestrians as well as wheelchair users to be able to go down and up uh, on, on different sides, um, solving the kind of perennial problem of architecture, which is what do you do with the staircase? Um, this is the interior of the, of the, of the school, uh, again, which has been torn down, and you can see how it has absorbed because of industrial um, and, and light-filled interiors that we associate with various uh, uh, modern architectures. Um, I think these are important examples to include into our discussions about disabled design and modernism because of how they uh, aren't, um, uh, in many cases like this one, aren't well known at all, and yet they seem to replicate many of the design principles and practices that we associate with, with modernism. And then finally, what uh, I'm calling new engaged subjectivities, which one could argue is present in those 19th century tactile maps and books um, that uh, address and encourage the subjectivity of the user um, through these new modes and modalities of communication, like tactile uh, or um, even in the case of someone like Helen Keller, the way in which smell and touch become the fundamental ways that they engage with the, the, the world outside of things like uh, braille or uh, uh, communication through the hand. Um, in 2012, uh, the Laurent family in Rockford, Illinois, revealed that it was uh, that the house that had been built for them in 1952 was the only house Frank Lloyd Wright had ever designed for someone who used a wheelchair. Uh, it had been in the family for 60 years, and because it was a private home, no one knew about it. It wasn't like his prairie school uh, homes or like falling water. It was sort of in the family. And when the oldest member of the family 
who was a wheelchair user, died. It went on the market and has recently been bought, refurbished, and it is now available as a museum. What's fascinating about the Laurent House is that it actually is one of um, Frank Lloyd Wright's Usonian houses, but it's completely adapted for use by someone with a wheelchair. Uh, you can see here alongside, um, on the left side of the photograph, a kind of long extended couch, but that uh, pathway would have been specific for a wheelchair user um, to be able to go from one side of that, the house to the other. Frank Lloyd Wright, in designing for the Laurent family, also designed tons of built-ins, which were, of course, of course, one of his hallmarks of design, but he also made it possible to design things like desks, vanities, so that uh, the members of the Laurent family could simply wheel up, do their writing, uh, and, and wheel away. Something that Frank Lloyd Wright had seen on ships um, and in military facilities, um, inspired by uh, you know, the, the building and uh, mobilization for war, and that he adapted for use um, in a private home. Built-ins, cabinets, shelves, ki kitchen counters, uh, counters in the toilet, everything were lowered by about a foot and a half, which um, is, uh, like many of Frank Lloyd Wright's innovations, about two or three generations ahead of its time. These kinds of built-in innovations for people who use wheelchairs or other disabilities really wouldn't be put into effect in housing design until at least the 1970s and even into the 1980s. So that Frank Lloyd Wright was doing this in 1952 was really quite an innovation. Um, the last objects that I will show you that speak to what I'm calling engaged subjectivities are not objects of design per se, but are objects meant to stimulate the ways in which people identify themselves and identify the spaces that they occupied. Um, uh, in the late 1940s, um, there was a uh, rehabilitation center for uh, men who had been blinded during World War II. And the, um, one of the mandates by the school was to create tactile models of every single building on the campus of the military base or the convalescent center. Uh, some of them uh, combined them. And so what you have here is a tactile model uh, with every aspect of the design sort of identifiable both by touch as well as by little tags that would have braille on them. Um, there was a mandate to make certain that those who were, uh, had lost their sight uh, weren't simply learning new techniques like Braille, but were also learning uh, about the, the uh, significant ways that touch might encourage them to move in different t directions professionally and also creatively. And one of the um, uh, most interesting inventions at the blind uh, school was what designers uh, in, I think, 1952 called a kinoglyph, uh, or a kinoglyph, which combines the word kinesthetic with glyph. The idea being that this, which looks to us like an abstract, non-representational piece of sculpture, was actually designed only to stimulate their senses, to train them to be able to touch in a much more kind of refined and sophisticated way, because obviously touch is not something that um, is uh, a very important part of military training. Um, this is another kinoglyph or kinoglyph um, that again is non-representational, but is really meant to stimulate the senses and to produce a kind of creative effect uh, or affect on the part of the veteran so that he or she can go off and uh, feel as if they have a different relationship to the environments in which they travel, especially built environments. Um, so let me uh, very quickly conclude uh, after having done that quick jaunt through three different categories, material urbanisms, mediated publics, and engaged subjectivities. My goal today has been to raise questions and think about disabled design, not only in terms of historicizing objects, but also to talk about approaches to historicizing disability itself. Not just a rehabilitative function of some disabled design objects, but also in terms of the ways in which good disabled design produces agency and autonomy.
This is an aspect of modernism that is often ignored or misunderstood given the overwhelming evidence of abuse and violence perpetrated against disabled people. Following from the critical work of post-national and post-colonial scholars, I would argue that disability objects push us to think about multiple modernisms or alternative modernisms or complementary or competing modernisms rather than singular modernisms. For every Foucauldian institution that prescribed didactic solutions for making bodies docile and instrumental, such as the prison, the workhouse, the clinic, the school, and the factory, there's also been a concurrent emergence of material and social elements that have made it possible to imagine different ways of being in the world that do not necessarily shut down one's relationship to disability or bodily difference. And here I've brought back the tactile map and the pages of the graphic with the uh, museum ex uh, uh, practices at the Sunderland Museum. More often than not, modernism is treated or discussed as a thing already proven, an explanatory framework already decided upon into which different kinds of objects and ideas and peoples can be situated. Perhaps it would be more fruitful to think about modernism less as something already proven, less a fait accompli, and more as a process, a cascade of shifting epistemologies that are happening simultaneously across time and space. The tactile map addresses a fundamental design flaw made manifest in maps as media of communication. Maps, after all, needn't be visual which privileges not only sight, but also the primacy of the visual in producing and transmitting knowledge. By contrast, the museum's introduction of objects from visual experience to tactile experience does not invent new objects, but instead shifts the methods by which the institution shares those objects, and by extension, reorients those objects for visitors so that the privileges of sight are not normalized ex as the exclusive domain of the museum patron. There are, in other words, other ways of knowing, but these reside in how an object is used or how it's engaged with, rather than in the case of the map, which is a new kind of object being created in the first place, although it kind of layers new tactile means over more familiar uh, cartographic ones or, or uh, uh, representational ones. The map uses both braille and embossed haptic information for communicating spatial and discursive elements that have been translated from the visual to the tactile. Spatial orientation is prefigured and embedded in the relationship between the user and the object, and thus is an irreducible part of its design. By contrast, the objects of the, at the museum are not different in any substantive way, materially or representationally, from how they are used by sighted patrons of the museum, except that they are being treated differently. They're being touched rather than being looked at, experienced through the fingertips and also through other senses, rather than merely through the eyes. Both the tactile map and the graphics documentation of tactile experience at the Sunderland Museum mark a particular moment in which material objects used by or developed for people with disabilities mark the coexistence of multiple modernisms. Thinking about these various and complementary modernisms, dialectically linked to more conventional, conventional or more recognizable modernisms, are critical to the intervention of new objects uh, excuse me, to the invention of new objects, as well as interventions repurposing or recontextualizing existing objects. Design historians thus have a singular opportunity to emphasize the centrality of design within disability history and also the centrality of disability within design history. And ultimately, both of these aspects of design speak to the question of how to historicize modernism to include those moments when bodily difference and human variability were not obstacles to solve the design problem, but were recognized as part of a group of solutions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, wonderfully rich and evocative talk. We can't thank you enough. And I think how very important for us as design historians and indeed practicing designers to have so viscerally experienced the haptic nature of our endeavor. And I think that uh, very often in our discussion of sensorial experience, 
perhaps with the legacies of literary and visual traditions, there is a predilection to favour sight and sound. And if one borrows the phrase of the 1951 Festival of Britain, we're round boys, not flat boys in this. So it, it was wonderful to have us engage with that materiality of engagement with space as well as objects. Oh, thank you, and one Claire. of the delights of, I think, all the presentations we've had is the way in which we've had built environments as well as objects as a key feature of our discussions about how you experience war, how do you rebuild peace. And at least for me, the great richness of your intervention is also not regarding this as, as you eloquently put it, obstacles to overcome. This is always putting a box around, whereas surely what is the uh, empowering message for those who survive war and experience its harm physically or intellectually, emotionally, is to regard our possibility as designers to engage with that as a process of, of forward movement rather than coping with decline. So many thanks for enlightening us mm. on that. And I didn't know that Frank Lloyd Wright's house. So that's a real <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, yeah. it, it literally, uh, in June of this year, yeah. it's been open to the public. So if you are in Rockford, Illinois, <laughs> about an hour outside of Chicago, I highly recommend it. It's quite amazing. But I can breathe. So let, let us open it up to, I'm sure you have many interesting questions from such a provocative talk. Can I open it to the floor? Are there people who wish to speak? Yes, can. Um, that was fantastic. It was really very interesting in all sorts of ways. And Thank you. I have a very confused question, which I hope you might be able to help me with. Which is partly because I worked on the title wrong. So I wrote down how to say what design change modernism. And then I was like, no, no, that's, that's not right. But then I was trying to think about, and I think you did touch on it in the conclusion, about maybe three different types of things that, that were going on there. Um, so, so firstly, what, is it maybe that you're arguing, and I might be completely wrong on all three of these, that dis, um, designing for disabled changed modernism because there was a need to design for that particular community? Um, and then maybe from the second thing, or does looking at disabled design change how we assess the claims of modernism? So either enforcing or undermining those kind of claims to universalism and yeah. betterment for all. Or is it also, I think maybe this is what the conclusion was touching on, does it call for the change to the historiography of modernism? So kind of how we understand how it's been written. Mm -hmm. Well, my sh the short response is it's all of those. Um, you know, when you are asked, as, as Claire did, uh, uh, for me to give a keynote, um, and I, I think this is true of a lot of occasions, you choose a title that's meant to be deliberately provocative in all kinds of ways, ways that you don't necessarily even know until you're in the middle of delivering it of the different way, the different registers that it operates and the different buttons it pushes. So, so to, to, to kind of quickly respond, what, I'm very, what I've become very interested in is th rethinking how we understand modernism, on one hand, and things like periodization uh, tend to be uh, boundaries sometimes, um, or they tend to be fences, um, and disciplines tend to police those boundaries, and one of the things that interests me about looking at these objects, which um, are part of what I would say are, are larger histories of design, histories of modernism, but have tended to be segregated into something called disability history, or that's about people over there. It's not about people over here, right? Well, how could any of the kinds of designs that we've looked at or any kind of ideas that we've engaged with, what does those have to do with canonical or conventional understandings of modernism? And one of the things that war does is war uh, and its aftermath, and also peace, they kind of provide a conduit between that stuff that belongs to those people over there and things that belong to us people over here. And I think that modernism um, covers a really wide ground, both those who have been uh, damaged by war, uh, those who are recuperating from war, those who are entering into you know, po post-war civilian life, but it also has a lot to do with people who have nothing to do with war at all. 
The development of tactile books for the blind may have addressed people who, uh, or might have been useful for people who suffered from mustard gas uh, in the trenches of World War I, but there are whole populations that have nothing to do with the, 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 the categories of war and its aftermath who are shaped by design elements, like a tactile book, book or map, or by uh, the kind of uh, exercises that a museum might have done. So how to include and how to open up histories to make sure that um, populations of people who aren't veterans, who aren't uh, civilians uh, sh shaped by war, how to bring them into conversations about modernism and design so that we don't have this, I think, artificial divide. Um, you know, in my, in my book, Replaceable You, I talk about the fact that veterans, uh, after the Civil War, and I think this could be extrapolated outward to other uh, nations and other wars, um, they kind of received a certain kind of status. Um, you know, if you, if you lose a limb or you b lose your sight as a consequence of war or uh, as in a part of an industrial accident, you're perceived, I think, in a different place in the hierarchy than you are if, let's say, you're born with a congenital disfigurement or you're born with a particular condition. The idea that you've sacrificed your body for the nation, you've sacrificed your body for the, 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 the cause, uh, or you've sacrificed your, your, your body or, or, or um, your abilities for, um, in the cause of industry, in the cause of productivity, kind of puts you into a different box than someone who might be perceived to be, you know, I don't know, a drain on the welfare state. In other words, there's some kind of uh, idea uh, of, of status that one gets from that level of sacrifice. So one of the things that's always interested me is how can we think about design? How can we think about modernity more broadly and say that those kind of divisions or the kind of hierarchies are artificial and they're generated by the nation state. They're not generated by sort of people. That, that we want to honor those who have given their sacrifice, but we tend to orient and that's true even now in, uh, for veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan in the United States. We orient our services to people who have made that sacrifice as opposed to people who we might perceive as just ordinary folks just trying to get about their lives. And um, in the United States, there has been a real effort uh, over the past several decades to try to uh, be more inclusive, but for a very long time, the people who were the, on the receiving end of benefits, technologies, designs, uh, were veterans. And I know that you know you're in a very. This is a very different country with a very different history of the, the you know the welfare state and public education. But I think that some of those hierarchies still remain, and they and they kind of haunt the way that we think about not just. Uh, how we interact with one another, but also they play a role in how we think about design. So those are some of the broader themes and questions that I was interested in. So the answer to how disabled design changed the history of modernism is not meant to be a kind of straightforward answer, but meant maybe it should have been um, how does how does disabled design open up ways of thinking about historicizing mo modernism or changed the um, the, the language or the vocabulary with which we talk about modernism, which is something that I hope design historians uh, continue to do. Thank you very much for your, for your lecture. I, I was very interested that you had a, an expanded historical frame going back. And I just wondered how far forward you will come. Is the Eam splint the end? Or where does modernism go in, your, in, in this project? Well, in this project, um, so my, my book ends in 1968. Yeah. yeah, for several reasons. Uh, one of which is uh, that in the United States, uh, legislation is passed called the Architectural Barriers Act, which is the first act which says that any, any building built with funds from the federal government has to be accessible, has to have elevators, has to have toilets, and so forth that uh, accommodate. So. Uh, that is the first piece of legislation in the United States that kind of actively addresses difference. The other reason is poetic, which is that Helen Keller dies in 1968. 
So uh, she kind of forms this very interesting arc throughout the book. She's, the book is not about Helen Keller, but she's kind of used as this particular kind of figure that as we saw in that ad, is kind of fascinatingly engaged with by advertising culture. I mean, I, I, I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that she was in the 20th century the most famous disabled person in the world. Um, and there's a reason for that because she was used in cigar advertisements and car advertisements. She was using she was in she did her own vaudeville act. I mean, she she traveled uh, you know all over the the world and was known that way. So 68, the convergence between that first piece of legislation and her sort of death uh, at the age of 85. Um, made it possible to kind of bring it to a close. But the other reason I did it is because there's a number of very good histories that have been emerging and are being written now uh, in Britain, France, Germany, United States about the post-civil rights era, the 70s, the 80s. Uh, you know, in the United States, writing about the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is sort of like the cornerstone legislation for people with disabilities is a little bit of a cottage industry. Lots of people writing about it, both at the level of design as well as a uh, level of, uh, of, of politics. So that's, I decided I want to do a prehistory. So for me, um, some of the questions I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested in, uh, in terms of urbanism, in terms of the public sphere, in terms of subjectivity are, 18th or 17th and 18th century questions about urban modernity, about shifts in the built environment, shifts in population, um, and I, I was just reading a, a book about the, the development of urban modernism in Paris in the 18th in the 17th century, uh, about you know omnibuses that went through parts of the Marais uh, or for, near the Place de Vosges in the 1660s. Right, so there were innovations that were happening um, in cities like Paris, London, uh, Amsterdam, and others that I don't think we would say that they were perfect uh, in terms of accessibility, but it made it possible for people to think about circulating in urban environments in ways that would just not have been possible unless you were wealthy enough to have someone who took you around in a carriage. But the idea of public transportation, I mean, we bemoan the, uh, the destruction of certain parts of, let's say, an older inner city. But from a disability history perspective, the creation of things that we kind of think of as ugly, like 1960s brutalism and other things, actually make it possible for someone in a wheelchair or someone with mobility issues to get around. Tiny little medieval streets are really hard to navigate. Um, uh, larger boulevards, you know, the kind of the housemanization of Paris actually opened up worlds. So, you know, we uh, uh, who maybe identify as able-bodied, we might say, oh, the loss of these beautiful little areas. But in fact, that loss becomes a gain for lots of other people. You know, so there's a, there's a campaign now to shut down parts of central Paris for pedestrians. And friends of mine who use wheelchairs or use walkers or can say, but I, what happens when I need a taxi to get me from point A to point B? So the pedestrian scheme, which is this very sort of nostalgic, uh, you know, romantic idea of the beautiful city, sort of is one that is, could only be conceptualized by an able-bodied person. massive rise of the Paralympian movement and the context that that has both for congenital disability mm -hmm. and also very much war veteran and how that impacts mm -hmm. on public perceptions mm -hmm. of that. So I wondered, because as somebody who works in the history of the culture of sport and recognizing how even within modernism, sport, which is such an integral mm -hmm. cultural activity, often mm -hmm. gets written out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I wondered to what extent you would have some well, it's again, it's it's similar to the, uh, the my final image where I talk about the difference between something that's designed. Oh, let's go. Um, something that's designed for a, a kind of a new new technology versus 
the recontextualization of objects that in another in, in one context would just be looked at and another ones would be touched and felt and that the invention as opposed to the reuse or the repurposing sort of is one of the I think interesting uh, continuums along which these different kinds of objects travel but you know in the 19th century and in the even the early 20th century um, sports actually played a, a very important role in um, uh, the, his, the history of uh, disabled uh, students. Uh, we have all kinds of accounts of blind fencing teams, um, and uh, which sounds like a joke, <laughs> but in fact is very interesting way of thinking about athleticism, not being limited to being only sighted. Um, so there are ways that. Uh, if you want to talk about a, a particular kind of modernism, right, a blind fencing team, I think be a really good example of that. And that's different from the development of, you know, kind of the, these super um, uh, designed legs, the kind that someone like Oscar Pistorius uh, used to wear before he was in, in prison um, and for killing his girlfriend. And the way that those even raised questions about super ability. Right, so how can this guy compete with those of us who are normal because he now exceeds the normal and so there's this kind of stigmatizing of someone with a disability because they're now seen to be even better at doing something that an able-bodied person uh, or that, that they're, they've exceeded the, the kind of uh, and, and entered, yeah, and entered the realm of the superhuman which, which led some people to say well maybe all runners should cut off their legs and therefore everyone can be out, uh, outfitted with prosthetic devices. So that's a very recent turn. Compensatory technologies and other kinds of devices for sport re, uh, in, for, for people with disabilities really comes in in the 1980s. Um, but, you know, um, teaching uh, people in wheelchairs to use rifles to go hunting, um, blind fencing teams, these are all accommodations and forms of training and rehabilitation the, uh, that, uh, and, and empowerment that don't necessarily have to do with technology per se, but have to do with a change in sensibility. And I think that's maybe one of the hallmarks too. This is not, you know, none of these objects are changed by the fact that they're being passed around to blind pensioners and school kids. What changes is the perception, the possibility, and also the idea that an object can be engaged with sensorially, you know, instead of just behind a, a glass frame or in a vitrine. That's an element, I think, of design or, or historicizing design that's really exciting. And I, and I think that maybe there's some parallels there with sport. It's not about new inventions necessarily, it's about new ways of thinking about the public. If I may, it also arouses very happy memories. Mark and I said at the first tactile tours at the Courtauld Gallery. Oh, and really? And the first sign tours. So, hurrah! <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> when, 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 when was In that? 1993. Okay. So 20 years later, those kinds of practices are far more uh, uh, common, you know, like in, in at, uh, other places. But it was still quite, uh, I, I bet you had to fight quite a bit to get the Corto, you had to get the Corto to, to recognize that and what you have tactile tours. Yeah. So many yeah. thanks for that. Oh, thank now, you. I promise that I will get us up to the Kelk in an unreasonable five minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think I probably best know these two closer. But let us thank David again for an inspiration. No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Many thanks for all of your rich questions. Those who are coming to dinner.